Okay, if we could get started, everyone, welcome to the third Madeleine Kay Albright Global Development Lecture. I'm delighted to have you all here. Beautiful evening for us to be together. When we established the Madeleine Albright Global Development Lecture, we wanted to honor the really extraordinary accomplishments of our own Madeleine Albright, and particularly in the way that she has forged breakthrough thinking in linking development and diplomacy. We've been pleased to post this evening dinner along with Brookings and the Blum Center for a number of years. We're delighted the Aspen and the Brookings and the Blum communities have been able to come together for this special dinner. My name is Peggy Clark. I'm the executive director of Aspen Global Health and Development. I've been here at Aspen for quite a long time and we see a lot of wonderful friends in this room and we're so happy you joined us here tonight. At Aspen Global Health and Development, we're continually searching for new breakthrough ideas. I'm sure that in the comments from Walter and Madeline and Helen tonight, we will be hearing some very important and breakthrough thinking, which is commensurate to the challenges we're facing today. It's really my honor to invite Walter Isaacson to welcome the speakers this evening. He's the original breakthrough thinker. Um, and I'd like to give a round of applause to Walter for bringing us all here together. Thank you, Walter. I'm an original breakthrough thinker because it was Peggy Clark who actually recruited me to the Aspen Institute on a Saturday when I had to secretly come visit. And it's because of Peggy and her global health and development program that we're all here tonight along with Strobe. Uh, somebody I've known even longer than I've known uh, Peggy, Strobe Talbot, has uh, been a mentor of mine and actually is the only person other than my wife who's actually read uh, all the books I've written, because he edits them for me, for which thanks. And Kamal, thank you for all you're doing, and obviously uh, Dick Blum, who put it all together. Uh, it's great to be here, especially thanks for allowing us uh, to have some of the Aspen trustees who've been very involved in global development. We have a Middle East program that did do an investment initiative, uh, a small business loan fund, and I know Burl Bernhard, Jane Harmon, um, you, you were involved, weren't you? Uh, yes, obviously. Uh, Madeline, and, uh, so, uh, and uh, so many other people. I better not keep uh, naming names, although I will give Henrietta a shout out, because I think she was involved on both sides, from the government side as well as the Aspen side, showing that we have great conflicts of interest and we love them uh, dearly. Um, I could go on, since Peggy gave me uh, two pages of talking points, but one full page is how good Peggy is, so I think I'll just skip right to the fact about how great Madeleine Albright is. There are very few people in this world, uh, other than our 64th Secretary of State, who understand both America's interests and America's ideals, who understand the importance of democracy and development as being part of diplomacy, but also uh, do it in a way that uh, understands that America's got to be strong in understanding its interests. Every now and then, people see a conflict in that, and I say, if you ever have to resolve that conflict in your mind, just meet Madeleine Albright. So, Secretary Albright, thank you. Walter, thank you very, very much. And Walter, I uh, write you notes, and we talk on the phone, and I have to say publicly what an amazing job you are doing as president of the Aspen Institute. It is a remarkable place, thanks to your brilliance and your dedication and your endless inventiveness. So it's great to do everything with you. Yeah. Uh, I uh, want to thank Peggy Clark and Dick Blum and the whole Brookings Institute for the support of this and the terrific discussions that have gone on. I am uh, delighted to welcome you all to the third lecture in our series on global development. <coughs> With all the uh, various events that take place uh, over the course of the summer, it, it can be easy to confuse some of them. But I can assure you that the name of this lecture does not escape me. Uh, I, I said um, that I'm a, and when I introduced last year, I said I was really pleased to have something named after me while I'm still around so that I can act modest about it. Uh, and electron development and health is much better than a post office or some horrible disease. So I am very grateful to, to all of you. Uh, 
I always look forward to this lecture with great anticipation because I find it quite relaxing to be in ha here in Aspen, but from this elevation, the world always looks a little bit better, and being surrounded by people of such intellect and optimism makes even the toughest problems uh, appear solvable. The purpose of this dinner uh, is to honor an individual who has dedicated him or herself to trying to really solve very difficult problems in uh, the development world. And uh, I can't think of anybody that is better to uh, tackle issues and that we should honor tonight than the administrator of uh, UNDP. Uh, I have known Helen for some time, and she truly has been a remarkable political figure uh, and a great leader of UNDP. Helen grew up on a sheep and cattle farm in Upper North Island of New Zealand, and she attended school at the University of Auckland, where she, she received her uh, bachelor's and master's degree in political science before joining the faculty as a professor. She is a unbelievably determined politician. She entered parliament in 1981 and was reelected another 10 times. Uh, during her service, she chaired the Foreign Affairs and Defense Select Committee and played a major role in New Zealand's adoption of an anti-nuclear policy. She joined the cabinet in 1987 and went on to serve as Minister of Conservation and Housing, followed by Health and Labor, and shortly thereafter, she became the first female deputy prime minister. Helen did not let Labor's loss in 1990 deter her. In 1993, she was elected head of the Labor Party and became the first woman in New Zealand to lead a major party. And after the Labor Party regained power in 1999, she became prime minister, shattering yet another glass ceiling. She served three successive terms, the first prime minister in New Zealand's history to do so. Uh, is anyone uh, sensing a theme here? Um, as uh, prime minister, Helen made a point of promoting diversity, appointing 11 women and four Maori to her cabinet. She embraced New Zealand's history and prioritized the development of an inclusive, multicultural, and multi-faith society. And Helen's government oversaw a period of economic growth, low levels of unemployment, and significant investments in health and education. And thanks to her dedication, New Zealand is now at the forefront of nations dedicated to combating the effects of climate change. So after achieving all this, you'd think she might want to take a break, but instead, she chose to assume a post that is arguably even more difficult than running a country. Uh, in 2009, she became administrator of the UN Development Program and chair of the United Nations Development Group. Now, when I was ambassador at the UN, I learned to work and understand what UNDP really does, and it directs an amazing development system and it works in partnership with countries and relevant stakeholders all around the world um, to really uh, make sure that global development is coordinated. And I have a very special interest now in the work that goes on. I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute that works on democracy and governance. And many of you know that there is this endless discussion always as to what comes first, political development or economic development. They clearly go together because democracy has to deliver. People want to vote and eat. And so what is terrific is NDI is one, to talk about conflict of interest, uh, NDI and UNDP do many projects together, and I believe that that is the only way to work on reducing uh, poverty. So I'm delighted that Helen is here with us and is now going to speak to us, and she is the original Xena warrior princess. <laughs> And remember, Xena Warrior Princess is a New Zealand actress <laughs> who grew up in my constituency. <laughs> uh, Secretary Albright, uh, Senator Feinstein, uh, Dick Bloom, Walter, and after that I think I'll say all protocols observed. It's a great honour to be asked to give uh, this annual lecture, uh, not only because the Aspen Institute is prestigious, but also Madeline is such a trailblazer for women who has excelled at the highest level of public service is a personal heroine of mine. I'm not sure that Madeline would remember the first time she met me, but I know that it was August 1998. 
and Madeline came to New Zealand as Secretary of State. I was in my fifth year as Leader of the Opposition, so really I was nobody, but Madeline fitted me and my colleagues into her programme. And that uh, meant a lot at, at the time to me. My nine years as Prime Minister only briefly overlapped with Madeline's time as Secretary of State, but I have long followed her no-nonsense, straight-talking style and her singular contribution to global diplomacy. So I thought for a lecture, uh, given in Madeline's name, I should start with a quote from Madeline. And indeed, I will quote from the closing paragraph of her book, Prague Winter, A Personal Story of Remembrance and War, 1937-48. to 48. And it says, I've spent a lifetime looking for remedies to all manner of life's problems, personal, social, political, global. I am deeply suspicious of those who offer simple solutions and statements of absolute certainty or who claim full possession of the truth. Yet I have grown equally sceptical of those who suggest that all is too nuanced and complex for us to learn any lessons, that there are so many sides to everything that we can pursue knowledge every day of our lives and still know nothing for sure. You read a quote like that and you know Madeline is a woman after one's own heart. As those words resonate with me after a lifetime of immersion in politics and public policy, and they also provide rather a good entry point for the theme I've chosen for tonight's lecture, which is making sense of the world we live in, the development contribution. Yes, the issues our world is grappling with are all complex, but it's absolutely vital for those who are trying to make a difference for the better to move beyond uh, paralysis by analysis to the practical steps which might help. Bringing about transformational change is never about one swing of a wheel. It's more likely to be about a series of consecutive moves which over time will fundamentally change the rules of the game. That requires one to take a long-term view, and nowhere is that more so than in development. But nor is it a new concept. As the old adage coined in medieval France says, Rome wasn't built in a day either. Far from seeing anything built in a day right now, we see a great deal destroyed in a day, in a few days or in a great many consecutive days. It is hard to remember a time when more crises were jostling for space in the headline news or when the world's leading diplomats like Secretary of State John Kerry and the UN Secretary General were engaged in shuttle diplomacy on so many issues at the same time. Top of mind, by the beginning of this month, were the conflicts in Gaza and eastern Ukraine, even crowding out the disastrous Syrian conflict, which is into its fourth year, the control of a significant swathe of Iraq by ISIS, the descent of Libya into a new chapter of its crisis, the ongoing horror in South Sudan with fears of famine there growing, attempts to stabilize Central African Republic and Mali, the search for the missing Nigerian schoolgirls, and more. And even then, that list of current challenges would be far from complete. Kenya is suffering a number of terrorist attacks. There is a serious food shortage looming in Somalia. Boko Haram's activities have spilled over into Cameroon. The list just goes on. Often the global public's reaction is, can't the UN do something? And I'm afraid the answer often is, apart from rallying humanitarian and recovery responses, not much. Geopolitics are such that a military or peacekeeping response may not be sanctioned by the Security Council, even where it might be appropriate. And even if it were sanctioned, raising the funding and the troops required for such responses now is straining the limits of what is possible. Yet, meeting the costs of humanitarian relief from all the crises is also proving simply overwhelming. Even before this year's horrors began, 2013 had been a record year for worldwide spending on such relief, not only for people caught up in conflicts, but also in the serious natural disasters like that of the mega typhoon in the Philippines. Last year, it's estimated that $22 billion was spent on humanitarian relief 
27% more than in 2012. And even that sum obviously pales into insignificance when one looks at the human and financial costs to the countries directly impacted. The World Bank has estimated that where countries have gone through a civil war, their economies take on average 14 years to return to original growth paths. And it can also take more than a decade to return to pre-conflict levels of human rights observance, which might not have been very high in the first place. A major natural disaster, of course, can also impact very negatively on an economy. One which has had only fleeting media attention recently is the one in a hundred years flooding in the Balkans, which has knocked 0.9% off Serbia's already very low growth forecast and put it down into negative territory. By the end of June this year, the UN coordinated appeals for humanitarian crises had already reached 16.4 billion. That's at the halfway mark. It was 22 billion for the whole year, the record year last year. And that mark was reached before the latest conflict in Gaza began and before a lot of the fighting in eastern Ukraine and in Iraq. We have to ask, could this year's relief spending be even more costly than last? So I think these challenges and the scale of them are cause for a lot of reflection. And we must ask the question, could more be done to anticipate, prevent or mitigate these traumatic events? I think the short answer is yes, it could, and that there is really now a compelling need to try to get ahead of the curve of future crises and disasters to avert huge and costly development setbacks and lives lost. This need has been well recognised in development circles. Take Lord Ashdown's report to Britain's Department for International uh, Development in 2011 calling for investments and building resilience to the natural disasters to be stepped up. USAID has also recognised the need to budget more on this, as has the European Commission. But to date, the spending on prevention and preparedness for the natural disasters is remaining a rather small part of the global aid budgets. Yet the rough estimates suggest that for every dollar we spend in disaster preparedness and mitigation, we will save seven when a disaster strikes. Putting in place the early warning systems, the rapid response capacity, the resilient infrastructure and systems, the government and community capacities to play their part in disaster risk reduction, these are all highly cost-effective development interventions. We work at UNDP in these areas and we see the payoff when events of a magnitude which in the past would have uh, ca caused many, many deaths, now have much less impact. And Bangladesh and Mozambique, both poor countries, are good examples of what can be done. But obviously, averting the humanitarian catastrophe of outbreaks of serious violence is a rather intrinsically more difficult task than reducing the risk of natural disasters. And it's also true that spending in the fragile states which have been or still are immersed in conflict, does absorb a significant amount of global official development assistance. A good deal of it, though, goes on humanitarian relief, as it must. And that leaves relatively small sums for the longer-term investments, which might advance inclusive governance and legitimate politics and mediate local tensions and ward off conflict. I think it's worth reflecting on some of the lessons learned in South Sudan, which has been the recipient of a great deal of donor political and financial support, including from uh, this country, uh, before and since its independence in 2011. And on the not dissimilar case of Timor-Leste, whose independence came uh, uh, 12 years ago. In each, we saw the great celebration at the launching of the new states but nations were not built. And both inherited a legacy of very significant internal conflict and a lack of sense of nationhood across the countries. There has been a lot of support for building institutions of the new states, but somehow that didn't respond to the deeper needs to build reconciliation and cohesion within them. Both experienced a renewal of conflict within a very short time after independence. 
perhaps applying lessons learned from Timor-Leste where the international community almost declared victory at the time of independence and packed up and went fairly quickly, it did not withdraw quickly from South Sudan after independence. And the fact that the UN peacekeepers are there to this day and open their gates to desperate people has probably saved tens of thousands of lives since last December. But had more systematic support for nation building, reconciliation, inclusive governance, legitimate politics been pursued from the outset, would one quarter of the population now be displaced and the country at risk of famine? One innovation in development which the government of Timor-Leste has been at the forefront of driving, based on its own experience, is the formation of what is called a little G7+, plus, contrasted with the big G7. This is a grouping of 20 states which themselves identify, self-identify as fragile. And they seek engagement with the development partners through meaningful compacts to address key challenges. And these two groupings, the donors and the fragile states, have come together in an international dialogue on peace building and state building. And at the Pusan High Level Forum on Aid Effectiveness uh, three years ago, they launched what's known as the New Deal for Engagement in Fragile States, aimed at preventing relapse into conflict and getting uh, momentum on development. So, you know, this is a good direction to be moving in. But how has it worked in practice in South Sudan? Well, South Sudan was one of those uh, who engaged in the New Deal process from 2011. And it was working towards signing a compact with donor partners. And as part of that, it conducted its own fragility assessment, because in development, one very much believes in the country leading on such things. Well, the assessment, not surprisingly, said we need much more national dialogue and reconciliation, much more inclusive politics, and more effective and fair justice and security sectors. Unfortunately, at the end of the assessment, it concluded that the country had come out of the violent conflict phase of its crisis and was in recovery mode. I guess hindsight is a wonderful thing. The New Deal approach was premised on having simple and streamlined processes with priorities and mutual accountability agreed on between a government and the donor partners. And in South Sudan, a signing was contemplated for December 2013. <laughs> the process then collapsed under its own weight as the government was trying to negotiate not only this compact, but also the IMF program, the World Bank loan, the African Development Bank loan, a European Union grant, and a complex pooled fund mechanism. Our judgment at UNDP is that this would have been a challenge even for much more developed countries with long experience with these instruments. And for South Sudan, it was simply overwhelming. Sadly, the violent conflict broke out again just after the New Deal signing was last postponed, and one sees little prospect of going back to it in the short term. So what I draw from all this is that to make the investments which need to be made to maintain cohesion within fragile nations, development actors need to be a lot more pragmatic and fleet of foot than we've seen in that example. And also need to see development as much more than just a technical process of building government structures and service delivery and infrastructure. Development is ultimately a political process. It does require leadership and vision and tolerance and inclusion and legitimate politics if the full benefits are to be reaped and there are not serious setbacks experienced. So I would venture to say that that insight could be helpful in understanding some of the dynamics at play and the uprisings we've seen in a number of the Arab states. Yemen aside, these convulsions have all occurred in states which were far from the bottom of UNDP's Human Development Index, which measures GDP per capita, life expectancy, and years of schooling. And I find it somewhat ironic that one month before uh, Tunisia's uprising, UNDP's 20th anniversary Global Human Development Report hailed Tunisia for being a very fast mover on human development. It may have been on GDP per capita, education levels and growing life expectancy, uh, but something else was badly wrong in the state of Denmark. 
as it were. So across the Arab states where we've seen the uprisings, you see uh, varying degrees of exclusion in economic and social terms and also in their governance and politics. There were long-term leaders who had no obvious successes and the states concerned were for the most part repressive. The economic faltering in Tunisia and Egypt in the wake of the global financial crisis may well have been the tipping point for the uprisings there, uh, but that then fanned flames which went uh, well beyond. UNDP's Human Development Reports for that region since 2002 had identified serious underlying development deficits in freedoms and governance, education and women's empowerment. These reports were never terribly popular in the region. The first day marsh I had as administrator of UNDP was from ambassadors from the region concerned. The 2009 report was particularly unpopular as it highlighted major challenges in human security, including high rates of youth unemployment. In effect, trouble was predicted through these reports if the development deficits weren't addressed. But it's the way of the world that the reports have received far more attention since 2011 than they did in the nine years before. Obviously, in development, we work in many such settings. What I observe is that if a process of inclusion and change is not embraced by a country's leadership, sooner or later, change will be forced upon it. And that may come, as we've seen, at a terrible cost in human life and to economies. The outcome of such convulsions may be very uncertain. Things may get a great deal worse before they get better, and they may not get better for a very long time. So this leads me to the development contribution which could be made to building the peace and stability which are the foundations for sustainable development. And I want to set this briefly in the context of this emerging post-2015 development agenda and how it could include priorities which would aim to address uh, some of these issues. In this well-informed audience, I think uh, people uh, know very well that the Millennium Development Goals are running their course and the global debate is running hot on what uh, should uh, replace them. And there's a lot to play for because global agendas at their very best can set priorities, they can mobilise funding and partnerships around specific targets as the MDGs did. And the evidence certainly suggests that on the health targets at the least, the progress since the launching and following of the MDG targets has got far better results across uh, the areas targeted than we saw in the trends beforehand. And I also have little doubt that the huge focus on enrolling children in school uh, has been extremely beneficial in getting close to universal primary school enrolment. And you know, would we now have 22% of, of, of the world's parliamentarians as women if we hadn't set a target for 30%, which we won't meet, but it's certainly better with where the century started at around 14%. Uh, so this next agenda is looking like being a bolder one than the MDGs were. There's a desire to go to zero on eradication of extreme poverty, children out of school, and hunger and malnutrition, and to finish other unfinished business in the MDG agenda. But for me, a major question is, will it also pursue sustainability of progress based on inclusive, equitable, and peaceful societies? Will it address the world's high levels of inequalities and marginalization and issues of the rule of law and access to justice and accountable governance? Will it address disaster risk reduction and the drivers of conflict? Because we see deficits in all these areas producing major development setbacks. I see human development as being not just about lifting people out of poverty. It has to be about keeping them out of poverty. And that requires all the issues I'm talking about to somehow be uh, addressed. Now, we do have a report from a major General Assembly uh, working group uh, on the next agenda. And it includes a proposed goal to promote peaceful and inclusive societies to provide access to justice for all and to build effective, accountable, inclusive institutions. It recommends targets and 
on the rule of law and participatory and representative decision making, on tackling corruption and promoting and enforcing laws against discrimination. And there are also a number of very good references to the importance of disaster risk reduction. Uh, this is good. If the cycle of major humanitarian crises is to be broken, then more peaceful and cohesive and resilient nations need to be built. Significant deficits in governance, major inequalities and exclusions, and unmitigated exposure to natural disasters are setting so many countries back time and time again. But these deficits can be addressed, and a major step towards addressing them would be to get them prioritised in the next global development agenda. I referred briefly earlier to some of the practical steps which can be taken to reduce uh, the risks posed by the natural hazards. But there's similarly practical steps you can take to support inclusive governance, legitimate politics, establish the rule of law, uphold human rights. We work in this area around access to justice, uh, establishing effective institutions, including the human rights ones, supporting countries to meet their human rights convention obligations, including on the equal rights of women, encouraging interaction between civil society and government, developing the capacity of parliaments to scrutinise governments, conduct fair and transparent elections. All of this kind of work is an investment in peace and stability, enabling rights to be upheld and differences to be resolved peacefully. And these are critical investments to be making when states are coming out of conflict. Uh, I should also add that alongside this, and I don't have time to speak about this tonight, it is absolutely critical, critical to have determined efforts to grow much more inclusive economies and jobs and livelihoods. We touched on this in the discussion in, in the round table today. Some of the stellar rates of growth we see in regions like Africa are not delivering the, the level of poverty reduction which was seen in, say, East Asia at a similar uh, uh, time of its development. And if you put alongside that the fact that we now have, and this is a huge opportunity, the world's largest ever generation of young people, if we don't invest in those young people, we have a demographic time bomb, not a dividend. But we could turn it into a dividend if we focus on inclusive economies, jobs and livelihoods and youth potential. It's something very, very important on the UN agenda. So where are we going from here on this next global development agenda? Well, this report that's come out from the Open Working Group, I sometimes say Open Ended Working Group, is an important step. Now the Secretary General must produce a synthesis report on what's happened so far, and then the member states will start negotiating. And the idea is to have a new agenda, which the heads of state and government will come to New York and sign in September 2015. Now, I came and signed the last iteration of all this, which was the Millennium Declaration in 2000. And I hope that the current generation of leaders will take as much pride and interest in setting the next agenda as I did and my cohort did uh, all those years ago. But I don't underestimate the magnitude of negotiating this agenda. We live in a multipolar world which has so many fractures and with multilateralism under a lot of pressure. And when I look at negotiations uh, in the multilateral world, I see how hard it has been to negotiate outcomes at the Commission on the Status of Women and on Population and Development and in the multilateral trade talks and the climate talks. It isn't easy. Many of the key issues involved in building peaceful and cohesive societies and the rule of law are seen as very controversial in multilateral settings. Some countries raise issues of sovereignty and others raise concerns about conditionality if these sorts of issues are in the agenda. And as well, it is really quite disturbing to see the resistance in some quarters to the full empowerment and equality of women and to sexual and reproductive health and rights. There's been a lot of pushback on these issues since the high watermarks of the Beijing Conference on Women and the Cairo Conference on Population and Development. Whatever the outcome of the negotiations on the new agenda, of course, those of us involved in development and working in these issues will get on with our, our work. Uh, while all the areas I've been talking about are seen as very controversial uh, when member states start negotiating, the truth is 
that the great majority of developing countries actually ask us to work on these issues. So there's something a little bipolar uh, operating here. This kind of work has a long time frame, particularly where societies have fallen into an abyss, like South Sudan, Central African Republic, and Syria, and more. And the rebuilding, when it can occur, can take decades. That's all the more reason now to be scanning the horizon with conflict-sensitive analysis to see which countries now, which are not in outright conflict, have the precursors of conflict and upheaval present and how they might be addressed in development terms. It's certainly my hope that with strong partnerships and goodwill, we could work for a world with this next development agenda where by 2030 we don't see tragedies like those of today dominating our headlines. But our world will need a sea change on inclusive growth, legitimate politics, equity, human rights and the rule of law to achieve that. As development actors, we can play our part, but those who lead countries and those who aspire to lead them must also play theirs. Thank you. We'd like to offer Helen the opportunity to take a few questions and answers. And if uh, everyone could please enjoy their meal while we're doing so. Go ahead. Hi, good evening. My name is Sarah Lucas from the Hewlett Foundation. Thank you so much for a tour de force of issues and motivation. I am so struck by the point that you've just made that some of the most controversial issues in the post-2015 agenda are issues that countries come to you for. Yeah. And I want to know what we do about this because it feels like there's some potential there. Yeah. And so I want to hear a little bit more about how you're thinking about this at the UN yeah. of squaring that circle. Yeah. Well, the, the truth is they do. We have a big democratic governance portfolio and we are able, because the UN is seen as, as somehow politically neutral, to work on very sensitive issues uh, in countries. But there's somehow a difference between that being part of the program and then it being seen in the headlights in a in a government, uh, in, in a global development agenda, where they start to think, oh, is that going to mean that there can be interference in our internal affairs? And is that going to mean that if we don't do certain things, there might be conditionalities uh, put on? So that's, that's the dichotomy. But I, I could give you uh, an example of a, of a country which you know, isn't really flavor of the month uh, with many that I, I visited recently. Uh, to chair the annual UN meeting on Chernobyl, and that was Belarus. And Belarus, is, as we know, has a repressive government and a, a range of issues. But somehow there we've managed to claw out a space for civil society, and it often starts through things which are not up front and in the face, like the fact that the Global Fund uh, has money for Belarus to develop a better response to the HIV and TB uh, issues. It doesn't give the money to Belarus because it, it doesn't, and this happens in a number of countries, it doesn't deem the systems to have the integrity to which you could disperse money. So it gives it to UNDP and says, you deal with it. And what we then do is come in with approach which is very participatory, working with civil society groups in all the at-risk areas, who are often the most marginalised groups in a country. But it starts a dialogue between authorities and marginalised groups. We did a similar thing uh, with the Global Environment Fund money, where you have a lot of community participation, so you can create a space for the in in environment groups. We did it as a whole UN team around advocacy on 
the Disabilities Convention, which Belarus hadn't signed, but will eventually now sign because the disabilities groups have got voice. Now, these sort of three areas of engagement then led the government to say tentatively, well, would you like to support us to get a conversation going with civil society on the National Economic and Social Development Plan? You see, so you start, you know, it, it may be water dripping on a stone, but if you take a long-term perspective to try to open up a discussion and a dialogue in the society, you, you don't know where it may lead. It may lead somewhere a little more positive. Uh, so, yeah, the, re the reality is that in countries, including quite repressive ones, and there are quite a number of quite repressive countries, we are able to carve out a bit of space to try to take important issues, issues forward. But uh, we would obviously like to see recognition of the importance of the sorts of issues I've talked about in the global agenda, because it would also then you know, clearly give a lot more priority to addressing the drivers or the, or the precursors, if you like, of what could be significant conflict if there's not a, a gradual evolution and change. Um, given what you said about the need for economic development and political development to go hand in yeah. hand, what role do you see for the private sector to play in some of these more challenged environments? Mm. Uh, mm. You know, given the risks involved and you know the the, mm. um, the challenges that the, the companies would face going into some of these environments, is there a role that private sector entities could play in those places? Oh, I think so, and I think. Um, where the Western private sector comes in, it's under a lot of scrutiny from its own civil society back home. And so that can also bring, a, you know, good jobs. It can bring decent pay. Uh, you know, I, th I think it's unfortunate if the investment uh, interest is confined to countries that don't have that sort of legacy and scrutiny on how their companies operate overseas. So I think the uh, entry of the private sector can also be uh, an opportunity to open up uh, more social dialogue, as, as it were, between the company, the community, the, the workforce. Uh, uh, and you know, this can have rub-off effects on a, on, on a government as well. Um, as I said in the round table this afternoon, I think uh, enabling environments are very, very important. Uh, particularly for those who are looking to make long-term investments in, in infrastructure or utilities or manufacturing or services. Uh, but that's, again, something we work on. And, and if countries see that what is standing between them and the investment that they need, uh, then there's a chance also of, of getting entry points for the rule of law, for dispute resolution, for a proper court system, uh, for more integrity in government. Because if the message they're hearing is, we're not coming here because you're too corrupt, you can't resolve a dispute, you know, sooner or later you, you deal with that or you continue to be extremely poor. So, so if I'm looking at it in those sort of mega development terms, I can see a lot of positives coming from the private sector stepping forward. Mm. Um, hi. Do you have any concern in the, um, that, that climate change might be taking all the air out of the conversation? Um, I did, a, I did a, uh, a story not long ago about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, that are supposed to replace the MDGs. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to several uh, um, developing country representatives. And I did hear this fear that climate change was kind of taking over everything. Um, and each country's had different sets of priorities and we're mm. a little bit worried that the world wasn't paying attention because yeah. of this overriding concern. Yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that, yeah. whether this is happening, whether it makes sense or not. Well, I, I think it should be seen as a, as a huge opportunity because there's not a, a cent that would go to developing countries through climate finance that isn't extremely positive for development. Uh, for example, if you're talking adaptation to adverse effects, you're talking disaster risk reduction, which you know many developing countries have a shortage of money for. Uh, so, 
Uh, one thing I think we, we need to do is, is, is join the dots. We've got a major confer world conference going on disaster risk reduction in Japan next year, and then the climate change conferences operate with completely different ministers and different discussions about finance and so on. But disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation are two sides of the same coin when it comes to, to weather events. So I think it's a huge opportunity. And secondly, on uh, the mitigation side of climate change, uh, any support a developing country can get uh, for a, you know, a low carbon, uh, climate resilient green economy, to put all the cliches in one phrase, uh, you know, th this, is, this is positive for sustainable development. Now, what the developing countries will say, though, in the negotiations is that poverty eradication is central, right? Because there is grinding and horrible poverty out there, as we all know, affecting a very large number of people. Uh, but, you know, from, from our perspective, we say, yes, of course, in the end, this is about people. But people don't live in a vacuum. They live in an environment. And if you wreck the environment by the way you develop, and, and I'm talking you globally, in this sense, we're all in this together, uh, then we won't have a world fit for people. We did some projections in the Human Development Report of 2011 on what, on what current trends in environmental degradation and, um, and, and rising inequalities could do to human development progress. We did a range of scenarios. And on the worst of them, which I have to say didn't look that unlikely, uh, you would actually see uh, human development slow to a crawl. And human development, I'm talking you know, life expectancy, growth and in income, uh, education attainment, and so on. And in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, actually, uh, actually regress. So yes, climate change has had a lot of air, and it needs a lot of air. Uh, poverty eradication needs a lot more air, but we shouldn't see them as unlinked. I think they're, they're, they're very, very much linked. And the finance that comes as part of the solution to solving the climate challenges can be very, very positive for the development of the countries. However, I very much believe that the solution is the, pri is the private public partnership. Mm -hmm. And I've had experiences mm -hmm. in putting them together. Mm -hmm. When government wouldn't act, and you get various foundations in the private sector to act. Mm -hmm. And it gives a kind of respectability to what you're doing, yeah. and you're able to do it. So I guess the one point of disagreement mm -hmm. that I have, and that stirred me up with the question that was asked, about the private sector. Because in everything I try to do in the Senate, I try to lead with the private sector. Because then I know I can get the government's cooperation. So I would just leave that with you for whatever it's worth. And no country ever developed without a vibrant private sector, right? That's, that's the bottom line. So you, you need, yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Mm. What are your thoughts about uh, sustainable supplies of water in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and efforts taken by the development community <clears throat> to address the sustainability of water supply as it relates to their health and food security programs? Mm. Uh, I, I don't pretend to have any expertise on water, but uh, when we did a human development report on uh, food security in Africa a couple of years ago, one of the points it made is that Africa has very substantial water resources, but it hasn't had the, the infrastructure to actually uh, access and develop it and, and make, it, make it available. So I think you know, there is a development issue there, but then you have the, you know, obviously the, the very, very water scarce uh, regions where the Arab states region is probably the most, uh, most challenged of all. Uh, with, the, with the solutions um, yeah, lying in a lot more efficiency of water, water use. We did, a, we did release a report late last year on, on this, looking at unconventional water, su uh, water uh, supply from recycling wastewater, uh, 
course, the, the wealthy Gulf states go for the solution uh, of taking seawater to drinking water, uh, desalination, but that, that's poor countries can't, uh, can't look at that. Uh, much more effective water governance, I think, is part of the issue, and just much more, much more efficiency. Pricing is part of it. You know, free good does tend to be, uh, be misused. This is, this is an issue. So, yeah, I mean, w water is challenging, but it's not an insuperable challenge, in my opinion. Her dinner yeah. <laughs> because she has not had any yet. Let's give a round of applause for her. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to take a moment to introduce our, our, our uh, colleague who will give closing remarks, Kathy Calvin. Kathy is the head of the UN Foundation. She's a, a dear friend and certainly a leader who's been skating that road between development and diplomacy for a number of years. Kathy, we're so delighted you joined us here. And it would be remiss for me to say that um, there are so many friends in this room and there's so many devoted people who've worked with us on these issues for so long. And we really hope the conversation can continue continue. And thank you also, of course, to Dick. I can't, uh, I can't spend an evening without thanking you for initiating this Brookings Blum Conference and thanking you for allowing us at Aspen to be a part of it. Thank you, Dick. <laughs> Kathy. Kathy Kelly. Thank you, Peggy. And thank you, Dick and Strobe, Walter, Kamal. It's been a pleasure to be here. And we're looking forward to two more days of very good conversation. <laughs> Helen, thank you so much for giving us those comments and a very big compelling argument for the role of development in ensuring that we get to that vision of our world that's on the path from poverty to prosperity. I think you laid out the case that these next goals that are underway, that the UN and the nations of the world are working on are really critical to making sure that we have the world that we want in the next 15 years. You know, Ted Turner created the UN Foundation 15 years ago because he so believed in the United Nations, and thank you, Senator Feinstein, for what you just said about it, because he also felt that a businessman needed to put his money where his mouth was. And so he says today it's still the best investment he ever made, and we are appreciative for what he's done. You know, hearing from both Helen and Madeline tonight has been a real treat, of course. You know, both are strong, powerful examples of leaders who can handle anything that comes their way with poise, grace, and skill. I've been reading a lot of Eleanor Roosevelt lately because the UN turns 70 next year, and I look back at her as such a wise woman in shaping our support for the UN and also our world. And she said, women are like tea bags. You never know how strong they are till you put them in hot water. <laughs> So I'd say Helen and Madeline, I, that speaks to the two of you. And it's not a bad reminder from one of the UN's godmothers that as the nations of the world think about the challenges in devising that set of goals and as they pick the next secretary general, that we could think about that word about women. And Madeline, I'll just say this. The other quote of what Eleanor Roosevelt that I love, since you mentioned that this series was named after you, she said that a rose was once named after her, and she was quite honored that they'd gone so far as to name a rose after her until she read the description in the catalog, and it said, doesn't work well in bed, but works well up against a wall. <laughs> so be careful what is named after you. So I'll, I'll close with just one thought and a final quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. Since th both of these women tonight made the case that we are at a critical moment and we need to take every action today, not only to finish the current MDGs, we're less than 500 days away, but also to make sure that we are making meaningful and transformative change. And we heard several things today. It takes, whether it's genuine public-private partnerships or ensuring that we empower women and girls and giving them opportunities or unleashing the digital economy. We need to work together and the only way to do it is to heed one last suggestion from Eleanor Roosevelt who said, the world of tomorrow, the world of the future is in our making. Tomorrow is now. 
And tomorrow will come soon enough, so I'll just say thank you on behalf of all of us for being with us tonight, and especially thank you to Helen Clark and Madeline Albright. Thank you. Thank you.